Welcome back to The Deal Room. And Stephen, I had some wonderful feedback from your last episode, mainly because I think it was absolute optimal timing for a lot of people going through application season. So I've got a strong feeling that this episode is a great follow-up because it's very much like an extension, further deep dive into the world of M&A speculation. So just to whet the appetite for our listeners out there, we've got four topics that we're going to cover. Unicredit acquiring Commerce Bank. I think if you're engaging with any financial media at the moment, you've probably seen that headline act dominating the financial news wires. Then Qualcomm interested in buying Intel. These are huge firms, particularly as well in the niche of technology and chips. So we'll dive into that one. And then BlackRock and Microsoft's $30 billion AI infrastructure fund. What is that? How does that work? What does it mean? And then we'll end up with a update on Rightmove. We talked about this a few weeks ago, and that has ping-ponged as a, as a deal back and forth. So good to get a status check on that as well. But Stephen, how are you? And tell me about Unicredit and Commerce Bank. Yeah, thank you, Anne. I'm very well. I'm very well indeed. And it's, it's always interesting when banks try to acquire other banks. Because there are so many different elements to these types of transactions. And one of the biggest elements is that these banks tend to be national champions. Countries like having their own banking infrastructure. In the UK, we have our national champions of obviously Barclays and HSBC and Lloyds and things like that. Spain has got Santander and BBVA. Italy's got Unicredit and Germany's obviously got Deutsche Bank, but also Commerce Bank. And there's, a, there's an element of national pride here. And there's, there's always more scrutiny when there is a potential bank takeover, especially when those banks are from different countries. And the one that's on the docket at the moment, and this is just such an interesting story. If you guys are interested in M&A and are willing to get a little bit M&A nerdy, then this is about as good as it gets. So the story, the headline, is that uh, that Unicredit, the large 65 billion euro market capitalization Italian bank led by <laughs> legendary or infamous uh, ex-investment banker Andrea Orsell, has built up through a combination of of the dark arts of M&A and, uh, and regular stake building has built up a 21% stake or an effective 21% stake in German, beleaguered German bank, Commerce Bank. Now, I say beleaguered because Commerce Bank was one of those wonderful 2006, 2007, 2008 stories of banking hubris. If anyone's ever been to Frankfurt, they'll see the Commerce Bank Tower. It was briefly the the largest, tallest building in Europe. And it was a little bit like RBS in the UK, a smallish bank that got over its skis and, and did a lot of risky stuff, which led to the German government having to intervene and bail out Commerce Bank. So this story has got everything, including the German government that up until recently had a 17% ownership in Commerce Bank and still has a 12% ownership in Commerce Bank. So the story, and we're going to break it down into kind of three or four different bits. The high level is that Unicredit has built up this stake and Andrea Orsell, the CEO of Unicredit, has been quite bullish and saying, look, we think it makes a lot of strategic sense to have a tie-up with Commerce Bank. We're building up our stake it, it, there's there's economies of scale. We already we already do a lot of business in Germany. This would be a great tie up, a great consolidation of the European banking space. Olaf Scholz and the German government <laughs> have pushed back quite significantly, saying, and I quote from Olaf Scholz, "We do not support a takeover. We support the strategy of Commerce Bank, which is geared towards independence, and we want." Commerce Bank to exist to support and lend to the German middle stand, which is that great swathe of SMEs and medium sized companies uh, that power the German economy. So, Unicredit and Orsell making advances. 
12% owned by the German government who really don't want this to be sold. So it's feeling pretty hostile. And in fact, all cells gone so far as to say, look, well, we, we, you know, we're engaging with dialogue, uh, in dialogue with, with, with Berlin, but we're happy to go behind the back and we're happy to push forward because we think this makes sense. So that's the headline. Just, can, can I ask just one question that came to mind there is that there's obviously a lot of politics wrapped up into this. I remember just because I got to meet him a few times was, was Chaka Amuna, who used to be the shadow, I think he was the shadow chancellor, or he was on the Treasury Select Committee. He was running for Labour leader this few years back. Um, but he now works for JP Morgan. And I know that a lot of the politicians um, have done that previously as well. Is it common for an M&A team to acquire in this scenario some someone of that political experience and expertise and bring them in on a temporary contract almost to support the M&A advisory team? Yeah, it's a really, really common thing that once you've once you've served your time in politics and you've been paid reasonably well, but not the kind of big bucks, M&A houses come knocking on the door and George Osborne's another very prominent example. And uh, yeah, politicians have a way of opening certain doors and speaking the right language when it comes to complexity and it comes to politics. And when it and, and in these types of deals, not only will Unicredit, well, Unicredit is very close to the government in Rome as well, but Unicredit through its bankers will be, again, navigating the spaces in between the headlines that we read and the corridors of power, both in Commerce Bank and in Unicredit. And one of the main purveyors of, of these skills is Andrea Orsell, who I've, who I've previously mentioned. And I think this is really important for people that may not be quite as old as me or you, and a lot of people won't remember or maybe even be born by the time when Andrea Orsell was last in the headlines for being the head of the financial institutions group at Merrill Lynch, organising, facilitating that doomed transaction of ABN AMRO by RBC. Uh, RBS, sorry, in 2007. So this, I mean, there was loads, loads of stuff going on here. RBS, Scottish bank, tri with massive, massive ideas above it, above its station, went hostile with this acquisition of ABM AMRO, along with another, with two other banks that wanted different parts of ABN. And when you go hostile, you don't get to do due diligence. So it bought this company, it bought this bank, which it thought was going to add, I think it bought it for three times its book value, uh, which is a very hefty premium. And when it actually started consolidating that bank, realized that this bank was a complete dog's dinner of speculative loans, bad loans. And as soon as the tide turned in 2008, RBS turned from being, well, actually the world's largest bank for a period of time into being some, a bank that needed immediate rescuing by the UK government. And in fact, this is probably in the top 10 of the worst ever M&A transactions. And also was, was, was responsible for facilitating this transaction. So one of the headlines in the FT a few days ago is, is this Orsell's redemption play? 15 years ago, 17 years ago, he had an absolute shocker, which contributed in part to the malaise of the European banking system. And now he's back trying to do something that seems a lot more logical, seems a lot more sensible, but still has risk, right? And still has the complexity that we've been talking about. And then what, what, what's the kind of basis of the thesis then of what, why he's going after this, apart from that, to try and restore reputation or what, what's the more strategic rationale? Yeah, there's, there's a number of reasons. I think, uh, I think the wider investment community quite like this acquisition or quite like this idea. And in fact, some of the smaller commerce bank shareholders have come out and said, yeah, give this, give this some airing because this, this could make sense. One of the strategic reasons is we don't have enough big banks in Europe to compete against the mega banks in the US. We've got UBS, uh, you know, Barclays has been struggling. Santander, not massive investment banks. So consolidation is not a bad shout when it comes to achieving 
Again, economies of scale achieving the size that you need to compete against the JP Morgans and the Bank of Americas of this world. So there's a strategic sense there. Also, by acquiring a German bank, you get access to cheaper funding, more expensive to borrow for, as a bank uh, in Italy, because it's, Italy's got a worse credit rating than Germany. So you're getting access to cheaper funds. So there's a couple of reasons. Unicredit also has quite a big presence in, in Germany through, through one of its subsidiaries. So there's a lot of strategic rationale. And what I love about this story, and this is where we get a little bit m and nerdy, is the way in which Unicredit has managed to build up a 21% stake in such a politically sensitive company. So shall we get into that? Yeah, I mean, how, that, that just sounds like someone's taken their eye off the ball for letting that happen. So how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So... Unicredit, up until about two weeks ago, had a 4.5% ownership stake in, in Commerce Bank. Small, but not insignificant. And all sales been on the, on, on the wires just saying, look, we'd love this, love this company. We'd love, to, we'd love this bank. We'd love to get a little bit more involved and, and maybe start thinking about a tie-up. German bank was very, you know, German government was very kind of anti that. So... A few, a couple of weeks ago, the German government put up through their FFA, went to offload seven hundred million dollars or a four point five percent stake in Commerce Bank. So this often happens. Again, this has happened with Deutsche Telekom and Deutsche Post in the last few months. Governments intervene in strategically sensitive and important companies. They buy ownership stakes. Then they work with investment banks at the right time to offload those stakes because governments don't really want to be owning these banks and these companies in the long term. So this was strategically sound from the German government, a 700 million euro offload. JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs won the mandate to sell these shares through what's called an accelerated book build. So this is stock sold quickly without a formal marketing process. It worked. It works a lot. You know, this is a standard thing to do. It happened with Deutsche Post and Deutsche Telekom. And usually due to the fact that there's not a roadshow, there's not really much due diligence, it's quite quick. Usually that offer, that block offer is under or a slight discount to the stable share price of Commerce Bank. So it was offered to well, it was offered to JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs at a 1% discount and their goal was to find a bunch of investors to take it off their hands. Accelerated book build. What happened then was that Unicredit sniffing around swept in and took the entire block for 13 euros and 20 uh, and 20 cents. So they were like, look, you're offering it at 12 euros 48. We're going to buy the whole thing for 13 euros 20. Here is an offer you cannot refuse. Because if you say no and go through the normal accelerated book builds, you're not going to get a good deal. You're not going to get 13 euros 20 from normal investors. So, you know, <laughs> Unicredit, bit of a jujitsu move, like landing and taking this whole block for a premium to the offer price for the accelerated book build. But what Craig Coben in the FT said, and this is super interesting about the mechanics of this kind of stuff, is that if you sell a stake to a strategic, you expect that the strategic is going to pay a significant premium. Think about the premiums offered for M&A deals, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. So actually, what, what Unicredit got was a, an incredibly good deal to build up its stake from 4.5% to 9% by getting involved in this accelerated book build. So much so that the next day, because of this Unicredit acquisition speculation, Commerce Bank's share price rose to $15 a share. So $15 probably is the, the natural price that Unicredit should have been buying these shares at. But instead, due to the accelerated book bill, due to them swooping in on this uh, on this JPM and GS uh, book building process, they probably got it for a lot cheaper than they would have done. 
And actually, the German government missed out on, or if they'd just gone direct to Unicredit and said, we'll sell you these shares for 15, dollars, uh, 15 euros a share, then Unicredit probably would have said yes. And the German government would have got a lot more money. Really, really interesting mechanics. That boosted the, share, uh, the Unicredit shareholding from 4.5% to 9%. JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, for a couple of weeks' work, pocketed $10 million. Not bad. And, uh, and then suddenly they were up to 9%. Is there any risk, though, that the banks take with almost like a retaliatory measure from a government saying, OK, although this was all above board and taking advantage of a certain situation, couldn't regulators then within a jurisdiction make life a bit more complicated for an investment bank who's facilitated this happening, even though it was the government's fault? Yeah, there, there was definitely a breakdown in the terms of the mandate such that if I was the German government and I could see that Unicredit was sniffing around, I would say, you take on this accelerated book build, we pay you generously, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, here is a list of counterparties that you should not, you were, that cannot take part in this book building process. What actually ended up happening is there's speculation that JP Morgan invited Unicredit to the deal and actually wanted them to take the whole the whole block. So, yeah, there seems to be a bit, bit of a breakdown and there will be, we all know what awkward wash-up meetings look like, but there probably will be a bit of an awkward wash-up because Unicredit have played an absolutely magnificent hand here. All right, cool. So, sounds like the beginnings of a, of a Netflix documentary in the this, making here. <laughs> this is it. And this is why this is such an interesting deal. And, and this is and part two we're up to 9% with Commerce Bank, with Unicredit by getting up to 9% of, of Commerce Bank. But how have they effectively got to 21%? And uh, a warning here, the extent of my knowledge gets limited when we're talking about collar derivatives and, and lots of other different derivative uh, products that maybe you know a little bit more about than I do. So the build up of that additional 12% effectively is due to a derivatives position arranged by Unicredit's bankers, Barclays and, Bank, uh, and Bank of America. And they built up these derivatives positions in Commerce Bank using things like uh, a share, share swap trades and collar derivatives. Again, not my area of expertise but what is effective what this effectively means is that if there is a physical settlement of the derivatives i.e you go from option to ownership then uh, unicredit would effectively own 21 percent of commerce bank now any ownership stake over 10 percent of a european bank needs ecb approval so there is a clause in all of these derivatives that say physical settlement can only be made when there has been approval from the ECB. So it's a kind of, you know, double, d double faceted option that if the ECB sign it off, they'll make these derivatives whole and they'll take physical settlement and then suddenly they'll be up at 21%. And that then becomes extremely significant at the moment, it's more of a kind of bargaining chip and a, and, a, and a big position that gives them leverage in discussions. But these are the dark arts. And we talk very superficially about M&A quite a lot of the time. But this is where you're really getting, this is where the M&A bankers get paid, right? How do we gain leverage through different uh, financial products such that we are in a position to go from minority stake to takeover offer. I don't know if you have anything to add. I know you're a little bit better on derivatives than I am. Well, no, I, I was just thinking from a careers perspective. So for a large portion of our audience, you kind of think of M&A and you think of financial modeling, valuation techniques, things like this. It feels more like everything you're talking about is everything but that, where it's like <laughs> being a very sophisticated operator, understanding people's positioning, their needs and wants, the powers that be. So is it, how do you, do, is it a case of, and again, playing naive here, but do you just have the people who are like the, the modeling brains of the engine and yet they can be experienced? Because I'm, I'm sure not every investment banker at the beginning 
has even the capability to be that smooth operator. So are you an operator from the get-go? And it's like, you do your two years, you get your black belt. Okay, you can do all the necessary technical side of this job. You actually are destined to be the leader on these things rather than the math person. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a really good question. I think like, like with a lot of organizations, there's a, there's a very, very clear pyramid and the pyramid, you rise through the pyramid if you show the maturity to be able to first go from, all right, I'm just doing, I'm doing the grunt work to I'm overseeing people that are doing the grunt work to second, overseeing people that are doing the grunt work to helping run deals. Third, running deals on your own. This is when you get into director. And then probably the hardest jump from director to MD or from MD to kind of to, 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 to desk lead or whatever it might be. That is when you need to start gaining, if you haven't already done so, those political, those softer, those tactical negotiation skills. And the books that should be adorning your, your, um, your shelves are not modeling 101 or valuation principles they are the art of strategy <laughs> they are how to negotiate they are complexity related uh, business books and things like that so yes and this is why you can get a senior politician ex-politician going into a senior advisory level within an m a house because they do have a lot of those executive skills, those MD plus skills to sit across the room from the German government and go, all right, our boffins have helped, you know, have helped build up a pretty significant position here. And this is giving us the leverage to come to the table and actually speak to you, you know, suit to suit. So, yeah, it's 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 super interesting. And, and a lot of people don't make it right. A lot of people that are extremely good at the first few years are probably not good at the dark arts or at the negotiation and, and, and maybe vice versa. Mm. Super interesting. All right. Well, look, conscious of time. So let's crack through some of these other stories. So we'll move on to the next one, which is these, these huge companies, these chip makers and a potential merger. So what's happening here? Cool, call yeah. Intel. <clears throat> so I'm going to go from hostile to friendly. And it's always nice to, to have a bit of a friendly moment. The previous transaction, as you can imagine, is very much hostile, right? German government don't want it. The board aren't particularly keen. Unicredit's doing everything it can to get a position of leverage. Whereas this announcement or this headline, the chip maker Qualcomm explores the takeover of Intel. This is a friendly management to management discussion no formal bid so far, but this is, you know, this is the management of Qualcomm, a $190 billion market cap US chip maker, making advances, overtures towards the $100 billion market cap Intel. Now, why? Well, there's a number of different reasons. Firstly, the most logical reason, Qualcomm shares are up 50% this year, Intel shares are down 30%. So Intel is cheap, Qualcomm's got a lot of a lot of a lot of leverage because of its increased share price. Qualcomm's liked by the market, its strategy is good. Intel is not liked by the market, its strategy has been all over the place, such that its revenues in 2024 were only 70% of its revenues in 2021. And we spent a little bit of time a few weeks ago talking about that that divergence between NVIDIA and Intel, one shooting for the moon and one going backwards. So there's, there's, a, there's friendly conversations going on about what a potential tie-up might look like. And this is everything from Qualcomm cash plus share acquisition of the whole of Intel to different divisions to yeah, different parts of Intel. Lots of speculation saying that actually Qualcomm probably couldn't afford this at a decent premium just because it's only got $13 billion worth of cash and a 30% premium to a $100 billion market cap doesn't make it that much smaller than the market cap of Qualcomm. So this starts to look more like a merger and it starts to look less attractive. But at the same time, and this is what makes it interesting, Intel's like now, on, <laughs> now in play. Gelsinger, the CEO, has announced this big turnaround plan. 
which has boosted the share price. And there's been a couple of good bits of news, a tie up with Amazon Web Services, which has been well received by the market. So much so that Apollo has come in and said, we're interested in a $5 billion equity investment into Intel. So not a acquisition, just an investment almost as a vote of confidence for the CEO's turnaround plan saying, look, I think you're on the right track. This is obviously an extremely attractive industry. I think, we, I think you're doing the right thing and we're going to give you $5 billion. We're going to invest $5 million for you to stand on your own two feet and turn this company around. So suddenly Intel's got a few different options. And what I'm interested about, if I was an investment banker taking a look at this and a technology team uh, over in the US, what would I be thinking? I'd be getting on the phone to Broadcom. I'd be saying, Broadcom, let me come to your offices and pitch Intel to you. Next week, I'm going to come with a 60 slide pitch deck and say, what does Broadcom, Qualcomm's biggest uh, competitor, what does Broadcom, and has got a higher market capitalization, what does Broadcom plus Intel tie up look like? And actually, can we circumnavigate the friendly conversations and say, actually, Broadcom is the most realistic acquirer of Intel. So again, think about it from an investment banker perspective. Are they getting on the phone to NVIDIA? Probably not. Are they getting on the phone to SoftBank, who are very interested in this space? Probably wouldn't fly from an antitrust and a competition and a, a US national security perspective. But this is, you know, Intel's now kind of in play which is quite a remarkable thing to think about since it's a $100 billion market capitalization company. Yeah, and you were, what was it, less than six weeks ago, we were talking about Intel specifically and all the strategic missteps that they had done. And it's, yeah, quite remarkable, actually, how they, in just a space of two months, how much their fortunes have changed. Yeah, we would not be talking about this three or four years ago. We'd be talking about Intel acquiring other companies at, you know, 20, 30 billion dollar sizes. So that is, again, if we're talking about preparing for interviews and having some good deals to talk about, I think number one, definitely the, the Commerce Bank story. Number two, this Qualcomm story. I think we should skip just in the interest of time. I think we should skip straight on to Rightmove and make this a, an M&A trifecta. Okay, yeah, right, Rightmove, pretty much every time I open up the FT.com, there's a, there's a new rebuttal on either side, and this deal seems to be getting quite exhausting now. So what is the status? <laughs> yeah, it's quite exhausting. And, there's, and again, the reason why I want to bring this up is, A, we covered it a few weeks ago, but B, there's so much interesting M&A tactics and strategy involved in this deal that go well above and beyond some of the, yeah, some of the introductory stuff that we do talk about. So we covered the right move, well, the potential acquisition by REA, the Australian listed Rupert Murdoch controlled company making a bid for right move. And remember, they said they announced that they are very interested in right move. And according to the takeover code in the UK, you need to put a formal bid together within 30 days. In fact, they put three bids together for right move over the last couple of weeks. And the last one, the latest one, has just been rejected. So the latest bid is 761 pence per share, which represents a 37% premium to Rightmove's pre-acquisition speculation share price, uh, giving, it a, giving it an acquisition price of just over £6 billion. Six, six billion pounds. So it was rejected by Rightmove. And you might think, whew, 37% premium, that's, that's not bad. You know, they're getting towards that state that it starts to feel quite attractive. But it was rejected by right, Move for a number of reasons. The first is your standard, we have got a new strategy and we think that we're going to double operating profit in the next two years and we're really excited about the growth of the company. Everyone says that in rejecting an offer. But more interestingly, from an M&A perspective, is that this 761 pence per share deal is not all cash. It's majoritively, it's, it's majority REA shares. So you as a shareholder of Rightmove might be getting 20% of that offer price in cash and then the other 80% in REA stock. Now, this is a shocker for UK investors 
partly because REA is listed in Australia and a lot of UK investors have a mandate to invest in UK companies and would have to sell that stock immediately, which would in turn depress REA REA share price. So, so if you think about it from that perspective, REA stock doesn't look like a really nice currency uh, for, for right move existing shareholders. In addition, when you look at a stock acquisition, you basically have to back the, the acquirer's strategy, its management, and have to believe that REA, REA share price is kind of undervalued for you to get excited about transferring your uh, exposure from right move to REA. But REA is well valued. In fact, it trades at a significant premium to its peers in Australia. And it and the share price has come down 10% since embarking on the right move acquisition. So when you dig a little bit below the surface of that 37% premium, you start to realize that this actually isn't particularly attractive for the investor base that the shareholders of right move have now what rupert Mur- what rupert murdoch can do by the way is this has been a this has not been hostile so far so this has been friendly this has been management to management but the board keep rejecting these deals so murdoch can now go hostile if he wants and take a maybe 800 pence per share uh, bid to uh, to the shareholders 50% of the shareholders say yes then off we go Downside of that, hostile transaction, can't do due diligence. Is that going to fly? Is that going to be sensible? So again, this is really interesting as a case study because it's live, it's changing, it's rumbling on, and we're going to provide more updates over the next few weeks, I am sure. Just one last question then. For him to go hostile, is there a stop clock period between how many offers you can make with rejections and then a period of time before you can go hostile? I don't know if there's a cooling off period between rejection and hostile. There is definitely a cooling off period after you have made a certain number of rejected uh, friendly offers. I think there is a gap that you need to leave. Otherwise, you're just going to be spamming, spamming, spamming. Uh, Yeah, so the, the UK takeover code has got very, very strict rules in all of this. But I think they can go hostile whenever they want. And would it like going hostile seems like a realistic scenario so how does right move now protect itself and position itself so that can't materialize as a defensive play strategically well (laughs) uh, maybe we can link to our episode on the poison pill if you remember Mm. the poison pill that we spoke about a couple of months ago poison pill is a share a, a management strategy that effectively makes it really really unattractive for a hostile um, potential acquirer to to take over a company so maybe we can link to the poison pill episode but if you want to learn more yeah just check out that episode cool all right thank you very much as always Stephen, for imparting your your knowledge on these matters hopefully everyone who's listening finds that super useful for this time of year and all the best if you're in the middle of your application season and a shout out as well to a couple of people i met in Dublin, Ireland earlier this week who did mention the podcast as well and unfortunately did also say that he likes the banking, the deal room more than the trading floor. So he doesn't get his name shouted out. <laughs> he knows who <laughs> he is. Unfortunately. <laughs> shout out to that unnamed person. Let's go to Dublin. I love it. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Ant. <laughs>